everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with my good friend, Mr. Daryl Thorpe. How are you? Hi, Warren. Thanks for having me. I'm in the universe. I couldn't. <laughs> I could. I had to stay home today for family reasons. So uh, I'm just doing my cheapy background because my office is messy. So you're not actually really in space no, orbiting I, Alpha Centauri. I, I, I don't work for. You know, it'd be cool to work for SpaceX. <sighs> Part time, full time. I mean, I grew up in an age group as a, as a Gen Xer. I grew up with a f- massive fascination, like yourself, fascination with space. Have you gone down to Hawthorne? Where, because they kept the first Falcon 9 rocket that they launched and recovered safely, or, you know, or officially, is sitting outside SpaceX off of uh, El Segundo World, right in the front. Like, you can't miss it. As soon as you drive by SpaceX, it's just sitting there. No, like, but I am now. Massive. Uh, I'll pack my son up in the car on Sunday. Yeah, and take yeah, a drive you gotta down do it. Sit. You got two albums in the charts as we speak. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Yes, I don't know where they've slipped to in position in the charts as of recently, but yeah, it's kind of crazy to have a. Well, for a minute there, I had a number one and a number two. It's kind of wild. Barry Gibb, uh, Greenfields, he charted first, and then the Foos, uh, Medicine at Midnight came out, and then he they bumped Barry. So, um, so it was one two. It was a one two punch. So yeah. they both they both held number one spot. Mm-hmm. So Barry didn't call you all upset that, you know, how come you <laughs> you worked no, on an album? No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Actually, they started communicating, uh, Barry and the Foo Fighters recently. So it was kind of cool. That makes sense. D- Dave has uh, really good taste, as we know. And uh, you don't really get much better as a songwriter than uh, than Barry Gibb. Well, the I mean. Foos are actually, I did not know, but they're actually massive Bee Gees fans. You would think. I'm not surprised. It's all about the songs, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. True, yeah. true, true. I, 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 after watching that documentary, I, I, I love the fact that, we were talking about this on the phone the other day, that Barry used his live band on those records. The Bee Gees live band was yeah. on those records. yeah. It's incredible. Just assume they flew to Miami and just hired a bunch of incredible Latin funky players. No, they didn't. They just brought in a bunch you of know, like- No, and there's a, there's a reason why Staying Alive and More Than a Woman, there's a story behind why those are drum loops. Well, it's the same drum loop. It's something about their drummer had a previous engagement, like some sort of family thing, and they were recording in the studio. And so they decided to do a bunch of drum loop kind of things for the guys to write to. And then they ended up just using it. It is in the documentary. I mean, I think that's essentially yeah. right. Yeah, it's in the documentary. And and the drummer, of course, wasn't upset by it because it's my drum loop. I play drums on it. Yeah. And then the other side of the story is Toto was in the other room in Criteria and heard the Bee Gees doing the drum loop stuff. And they were writing Africa, which I never knew Africa as a drum loop as well, inspired because the Bee Gees were next door doing drum loops on their stuff. That time in the sort of mid-late 70s, I mean, it was a really fertile tie for music. I know, man. I never thought Incredible. that, I never ever thought that Africa was a drum loop just because it's Picaro, like, duh. I know. I'm, I, in my head, I'm hearing... But all the percussion, everything, it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Like, yeah. it doesn't move. But then again, you're just like, well, that's Picaro. He was a freaking animal. Yep, amazing. Way before his time. So, so give us a, tell us a little bit, because obviously two incredible artists to talk about. I suppose we're on the Barry conversation. So yeah. how did it go? Dave, Dave called you, Dave Cobb called you and said... Daryl, I want you to be on on this. And how long was the process? Man, it was it was pretty smooth and and very relaxed and chill. We basically just cut a song per day live. Basic tracking was done within a few hours. Um, an overdub here or there. Barry was not. Um, he was only in the studio for four or five hours a day. So he would leave, and we'd finish up overdubs or do a little editing, whatever it would be, and then. Um, uh, but for the most part, all of the guest vocalists that came in, we were capturing their vocals live. We were either doing keeping live takes and or doing a bunch of overdub takes and then comping in between here or there uh, from the live stuff to the overdub stuff. What's the process, do you think, in your mind that makes it feel so much like it's a tape record? I mean, I listen to it. It sounds like a tape record. It doesn't sound... As an analog tape? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. it's because the basic tracking is all done on tape. So you did all the basics, then dumped into Pro Tools. Yeah, I made a. Um, I have this method of working. It's like the the fake clasp thing, which I don't want to bash clasp on the World Wide Web, but I did four albums on clasp, so I I can. <sighs> what a pain in the butt, man. Uh, so anywho, I came up with this thing because Dave had, it's got 48 inputs on Pro Tools. The inputs malt, 1 through 24 goes into Pro Tools, and then 25 through 25 through 48 go into the tape. And then the output of the tape machine hits the 25 through 48 of the input of Pro Tools. And I would just keep those tracks in mute. But I could switch between because all of my headphone sends were coming off the tape, the input, the Pro Tools input side. So I could sit there and just mute and unmute as I wanted just to get a balance or a level. And so I was basically just rolling the entire time off the repro head into Pro Tools, pretty much just monitoring off of the digital side only. And then as soon as the take was picked, an edit was needed to be make, made to make the comp or take. I had everything grouped together and I could just do an edit real quick of both the digital and the analog. And then from there, I pretty much just mute the digital and then start working on the analog and start overdubbing from there. So that's how we did it. So you got the best of both worlds. You got the uh, the sound of tape, but you got the ability to comp between takes in yes. um, in digital. Yes, amazing, yeah, amazing. Yep. And what what an incredible experience to have Barry Gibbs sing songs that he wrote over decades with the Bee Gees. I mean, yeah, um, I have to admit, him. I'm one of those rare. Um, not rare. I think I'm one of the masses where I only know the Bee Gees to be, uh, 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 staying alive, not realizing that their catalog and that Barry's, um, as a songwriter, songwriting, mm. ridiculous, and ridiculous abilities, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, spanned way before, you know, staying alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then not to say that, cause I mean, how deep is your love is, Masterpiece. M- masterful song. But there's so is you Run To Me. Run To Me is like insane. And I don't think I'd ever heard that song before uh, until we started cutting that thing. But then Dave Cobb, producer, he was he's a massive Bee Gees fan. And he was more of a fan of the earlier stuff than the, the uh, disco era. So he knew Barry's catalog really, really well. And um, I did not. I, I'm, I'm not the big music authoritarian library guy that a lot of people are. So it must have been beautiful then. You're hearing a couple of these songs for the first time and, you know. I, yeah, and then realizing like, holy crap, this is a <laughs> freaking song, man. It's insane. So, Absolutely. And amazing. then also in, hearing it in a, in a way that, because I didn't really know the original at all. So hearing a new rendition of it in a more of like an Americana style. Sure, yeah. Jive of, talking. When I first heard that, I was like, yeah. Whoa, because you got yeah. that jive talking, like super yep. funky, and then suddenly it's like this Americana, rootsy, yep. Yep. country-ish version. Yeah, so a very, very eclectic mix of people. Um, yeah. A lot of artists, obviously, that David had worked with, you know, yes. Jay obviously yeah. being from Rival Sons. Yeah. I can't imagine what it would be like, you know, mixing with Alison Krauss and Dolly Parton and just these ridiculous... Uh. Yeah, Dolly was the first song, and she was the first one we did, and that was nerve-wracking, but amazing. Did you get any inside information, meaning, so Dolly's coming in, do you, do you get like engineer-to-engineer engineer calling you up, going, hey, Dolly really loves this mic, she really loves, nope, was there any? No, uh, the only other is is Barry. Uh, Barry has worked with an engineer, John Merchant, for... 20 something years and John lives in Nashville now. And so John was on the gig the whole time. And he, he told me, he was like, Hey man, I'm, I'm here for Barry. So you do you, you do your thing. And then I'm here to make sure Barry is always comfortable. Anytime we did overdubs or anything like that with Barry, John would record that. So that was a big weight off my shoulder trying to get Barry's workflow. And then the fact that John had been with him for, has been with him for 20 something years. Dude, that's just like, you know, why, why should I slide in and take that over? Uh, so that was am- that was the only kind of insight to artists coming in and saying something, except for David Rawlings and Julian. They won a Grammy this couple of weeks ago too, man. Good for them. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. David's a big like uh, microphone preamp 
recording connoisseur. So he brought his own mics for them to sing on. And I was like, hey, well, whatever. Yeah, great. Sweet. What was your mic of choice, choice for everybody else? Well, I pretty much just put like a 47 tube on everybody with the exception of like J.B. Cannon. He's got a really strong, powerful voice. So Dave was like, dude, just put an SM7 up for him because he'll probably blow the capsule out. And I was like, okay. So in that instance, that was the kind of like the only time I changed my plan of attack. It was just like 47 tube. What, how can you go wrong? With the exception of... Uh, David Rollins, Jillian. The really amazing one was Olivia. Dude, what a pro. And she goes, she sings a take, and then she goes, Daryl, can I ask you? Like, yeah, is there compression on my voice? And I go, a little bit, just like a couple of dB. And she's like, can you take it off, please? Sure. <laughs> she's like, yeah, because I really, I, I, I always hated recording with compression. I want to, quote unquote, work the microphone. I'm like, Sure, go for it. And she just had that ability and knack, and it was freaking incredible to watch. And then she sat in the control room with me and did her vocal comp. For for my little like eleven year old self, if I was in your shoes, I'd be so nervous. I she mean, that's was, Olivia Newton John. I know it's a li- I know it's <laughs> I know who she is, and I'm quite you know I'm still a fan of hers. I mean, come on, let's get yeah. physical. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah, and she was such a pro and Ugh. such a sweetheart and still so beautiful. Still has the her voice is just incredible, dude. Just like sweetheart. That was that was for me, that was the highlight of the gig. Really, honestly. Oh, that's amazing to hear. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Barry knew Olivia from Greece, because Barry you- wrote the song Greece. Which was a little bit of a big album as well. <laughs> a little bit of a big album, yeah. One of the guys I was most excited to hear about is Keith Urban. He's a total sweetheart. I had the yeah. pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, he did a breakdown at uh, East West of his record and just came up and played it acoustically. And it was breathtaking how good it was. And mm-hmm. um, and I talked to him afterwards. I just thought, what a down-to-earth human being. Yes, very. But I also loved his guitar playing. So he loved his guitar playing. Yeah, he's a real deal. He's like a talented singer and guitarist. He doesn't mess around. Yeah. Yeah, and then he's on the, the I've got to get a message to you. He's playing all the lead uh, electrics in that. Most. On that song. Everything else, I think Dave is playing acoustic, if I remember correctly. So who were the rhythm section on most of it? I see Brian Allen on bass. Yeah, Brian Allen, Chris Powell on drums. It's got Phil Towns, Hammond B3, Mellotron, organ, Hammond, piano, and Whirly. Yeah, Phil's this um, crazy classically trained. He just grew up playing in a church. Jason Isbell. Yeah, Jason played uh, electric guitar, and his that's slide guitar on his song that he, he did. Turner played one song on pedal steel and then the other pedal steel is Paul Franklin. Um, such a sweet human being, an amazing pedal steel player. Chris Powell played the drums and then Chris and Leroy, his brother, Leroy Powell played guitar. Dave pretty much has on lockdown RCA Studio A and the room is massive, huge. So we put the drums in the booth which we pretty much always do. The drums go in the booth. Uh, bass amp goes in a corner. Guitar amp goes in another little ISO. And then from there, everybody's just singing around playing live. And I just put like a baffle in front of the acoustic guitars, but then everybody's singing in the same room. It was just designed to do that. Everybody to be in the same room together with nominal bleed going on. It's just insanity. Dave takes advantage of that. So, and that's what we did in this situation. It's pretty incredible, including like, like I said, because we would cut vocals live and go for live vocals, but then sometimes just do another additional couple takes of over quote unquote overdubs and then edit in between the live vocal and the overdub vocal. And it's just like, eh, whatever. It's right. not like it shifts. For an engineer who came up in a lot of rooms in a lot of amazing rooms in Los Angeles, and then some of them a little bit newer, more modern, where you, man, you can't get away with that shit. It's pretty insane. The bleed is just not an issue. It's never, ever an issue or a thing. You never have to think about it in that room. It's so nuts how it works, but yeah. And if there is bleed, it's musical, it's usable, oh, yeah. adds ambience. 
Yep. Yeah, but I mean, Warren, seriously, there's you. You're like that should not. You solo something up, especially a vocal mic. I can't say what the project is because it still hasn't been announced and it still hasn't been released. But we did like an acoustic thing of in that room, and they they were filming it, so they wanted everybody in the same room. So the drummer Chris, the same drummer, he was on a cajon, which is loud as hell. So I just made sure I staged it to where the singer was opposite him, no baffling, and she's singing on a 251. And we did a take to get sounds. And then, of course, Dave was like, hey, what if she wants to fix stuff? Can we punch? And I solo up the vocal, and it's just like I hear that little in the background. It sounds like he's in an ISO booth, and it's bleeding through the door. That's how nominal it was. It was just like, what is it just can't. No, it's just so bizarre. <laughs> so that's amazing. So you had that little um, number one, yeah, smash hit album, and then uh, the week later you get another one with the new uh, Foo Fighters record. Yep, pretty amazing. I, I remember last time we talked on on the channel, you were making that record or finishing it up, and we were keeping it pretty hush hush. How long was that in the making? We started. October of 2019 and finished January 2020. I think we did a two-week break for Thanksgiving and a two-week break for the Christmas New Year, two- or three-week break for Christmas New Year's. So we basically only worked all of October, half of November, half of December, and then came back in January and did two weeks in January and finished it. So it was pretty quick in the Foo Fighters world. Uh, let's just say I was working my ass off. Well, they're a revolving door. It's just like, well, you do drums and you finish drums and you comp the drums. And it's like, okay, then Dave comes in. He does his guitar take when one take. Then he leaves. Then it's bass. The bass leaves and it's shifty. Then shifty leaves and it's Pat. And Pat leaves and it's keys. And it's just like, dude. Are they tracking live in the room and then you're fixing? Um, and no. Uh, or uh, Live as a band? No. They were just piecemeal it one dude at a time. Right. So, have so you done other albums with them where they are doing it live? Is it is there a I choice have, made? I, n no, the only live things I've done with him is stuff that's recently been released as promo stuff in their studio. The stuff you saw like on Colbert and uh, Fallon and all the talk shows. And then, of course, a lot of the stuff, they did a live version of No Son of Mine, which they just released to the, they did a video, cool video treatment for it and put it on their uh, website just for the heck of it. And it's actually a really cool version uh, compared to the studio version, just a lot more raw and loud, which is cool. So in that case, yeah, we've done. I've done a bunch of live stuff with them, but uh, when all, when they're recording, they just like to one guy at a time. It just everybody gets their fifteen minutes of fame, so to speak. Think about <laughs> it for a minute. And Dave is basically a machine, anyway, a musical machine, but he's a machine. Dave is a musical machine. Yes, yeah, yep. that is correct. Yeah, I always admire his uh, the way that he stays humble and happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like considering how much he, he's always working on. It definitely seems like the the when the pandemic hit a year ago and a lot of artists I were talking to were kind of so bummed out by the fact that they were stuck couldn't at home tour. and blah, 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 couldn't tour or just couldn't go out and be social and all that situation. And I was like, well, why aren't you writing a record? Oh, I don't feel like it. So, and, <laughs> uh, well, okay, that's your job. Um, but, um, you know, when you keep your creative juices flowing, you keep writing and you keep working, you know, artists that I know that if they're not on the road, they're at home in their studio writing. And if they're not home at their studio writing, they're out on the road. And if they're not out on the road, they're at a real studio writing or recording their next record. Like it's just, they just keep that constant back and forth of, of, it's it's extra i think it's exercise i think in dave's case he just really likes to keep busy but he finds that he enjoys the recording process of it but at the same token i think he does get a little bored of it so he wants to do something different that's still creative and still fun and but the two work together so then he gets bored of that and he's like oh well, let's go back in the studio so it it, it works hand in hand and keeps him fresh and always so wait there are you saying that they've, they've made another record <laughs> uh, can confirm, neither confirm nor deny. No, can't confirm or deny. <laughs> I, 
I love the sound of that record. And thanks, man. I, I think it. I don't know the political way, politically correct way of saying this, but I feel like it's a return to form. I think it's song after song after song. I'm really, really impressed with the, the songwriting on that record. Songwriting, yeah, he's really, really just knocked out of the park songwriting yeah. wise. Yeah, it's it's definitely loaded. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, they've always got great songs, but this one is like really fresh. It's it's it, there's an edge and a youthfulness to it. All the songs sound like you know what I mean, they're they're, they're yeah, they just grab you immediately. Is 606 kind of by now that you've done a few albums there? Is it sort of plug and play? Do you, is do you do you have kind of mic set up the way you want it? The drums are like mic'd in a certain way or are you guys experimenting a lot? What what's sort of your process now? Well, so so Medicine Midnight was actually recorded at a house. Oh wow. Dave found this house really cl- in Encino close to where he lives just to escape the the craziness of his busy day in life to go right. And so he just found this house and he set up drums and a couple of guitar amps in a little room and he just started recording and writing and then just put up a basic kit and a small native Pro Tools rig and a, I don't know, probably just like 16 mics at that or something like that, just to, for him to sit there and record. And, um, they just set it all up in the living room. And and then I checked in with them around August of middle of August of 2019. Checked in, said hi, and he was and then he sent me a link to the demos. He's like, What do you they he was like, dude, the drums are sounding really cool in here. And I listened to the demos he sent me. He's like, Yeah, they are. And then we were talking about just making the record at six or six. And then he said, Hey, I want to have a production meeting with you and Greg. And, um, also, uh, my friend, Alex Pasco, who works for the producer, Greg Kirsten. And so, uh, he, so we had a meeting at the house. He was like, Hey, can we make the record in the house? And I was like, yeah, we do it in the house. He's like, really? Like, sure. I mean, we got a, a bunch of gear to do it. It, and he's like, well, do you think it'll sound okay, Daryl? And I said, dude, I know you guys aren't really that concerned about time frame or anything like that. So why don't we just set up, go for a couple songs. And if it's like, dude, this is just the worst thing ever, then we can pull up and go to a studio. And he's like, good idea. Or go back to 606, whatever. Pulled a fair amount of gear from there, from 606, not everything. And then I brought a bunch of mics and mic stands. Greg Kirsten, the producer, he brought, I brought my Pro Tools rig. Like we just piecemealed a bunch of stuff and we made a studio in the house. So we've got something exciting to talk about here. Daryl is going to be doing, he's already done an incredible course with us. Daryl recorded, produced, and mixed five songs with a band at Sunset Sound. Over two days at Sunset Sound, then three days. Was it three days mixing? Or was it three days at Sunset? I can't remember. It was five days anyway. I think it was three and two. So that course is absolutely phenomenal. Um, if you haven't got it, get it. There's a link down below. Um, but what we're going to do now, and there will be a link for this, is Daryl is going to mix a song for a course, but we decided let's find an artist. Let's make from, it interesting. Yeah, let's make it interesting. <laughs> So you can either be the artist or you're the producer or the engineer. You have to have the permission, obviously, for these multi-tracks to be used. And you obviously have to sign off for the multi-tracks to be used in this course. But Daryl's going to choose an artist or a band that he wants to mix. So link down below. Please submit your track for Daryl to mix. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Like, what are we going to get? Let me see black metal or something well you've kind of you've done it all i mean you've got you've got like beck yeah but then you've got the foo fighters yeah you've got barry gibb you know you've got individually recorded parts live in a room everything in between yeah the one thing i don't do that well is r&b and hip-hop that's the one that's a whole other beast of oh and an orchestra i don't think i I think you could do an orchestra you could like a full orchestra? 
I've never recorded a full orchestra. I think when I was have in, you? Yes. Okay. Yes, but I strings sure. But with or, smart people, I've done. Well, well, I've done but, orchestra with smart people. <laughs> smart people, as you know what I mean. To, people that like I go to a room. The assistant engineer has been the assistant on a hundred orchestra dates, and I'm the engineer. I'll yeah. be honest. I'm, you know what I'm saying. I'm leaning on the assistant. So um, I'm thinking, yeah, like, oh yeah, I would do that. But I would move. Oh, okay, cool. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of orchestra I've recorded. Yeah, but I've done it with the bands that I am either engineering or producing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't. I'm not the first call for an orchestra date. <laughs> Shoot, <laughs> that's a whole different level. No, thank you. I remember being in East, uh, not East West, in at, at Air last year, and um, Olga Fitzroy, who is, I mean, you'll you'll know her. She's done Radiohead, you know, she's oh. done everybody. She had, you know, spot mics, close mics, ambient mics, all the clever stuff, uh-huh. and it sounded absolutely incredible. And I, I, I leaned over and I said to her, "How much of that is the decatry in the middle?" And she sort of looked at me. She's like. 90%. And yeah. basically, you just solo the decatry because yep. you have these world-class musicians in a room who all know how to play off each other. Yeah. And if you just set up a beautiful decatry where the conductor is, it sounds incredible. Yeah, I, that's what I – the um, the only time I've recorded in the – well, no, lying, lying to you, I've recorded in the hall, what, three times at, at air? And it was a 40-piece section. Yep. It was for McCartney. And then I just pushed the Jekka tree up and check phase. And I looked over at Nigel and he was like, good for me. Because <laughs> <laughs> it did. It sounded incredible. Yeah. You know, and then I just soloed up all the spot mics just to make sure nothing was going wonky there. And I was like, okay. Thank you ever so much. It's been a blast. Um, everybody, please click down there. You can go and check out Daryl's latest course. And of course, of course, the course. Come no, on, I've, send me something cool. Send Daryl something cool to mix. Yeah, please. I'm kind of looking for. I'm really excited about this. I'm looking forward to this. Daryl, go off and create some more rock and roll Cheers. history, my friend. Yes, I am off to the races. Are you on nine Grammys I'm, now? Yes, nine Grammys. You're so on nine Grammys. So one of these two albums has a really, really good chance of getting another one. Should sure. I just? I don't want to jinx it, but mm, don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> really good chance. Really good chance. Yeah. Well, I'd be nice. Nice to be talking to you again with ten. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, we'll Very see much. what happens. Produce like a pro family. Thank you so much. Please submit your songs. I really can't wait to start sifting through them and figuring out what's going to happen and pick something very, very soon. So, thank you. I'm really excited about this. Marvelous. Thanks, everyone. So long. Farewell. Have you desired au revoir? Tschüss. Goodbye. Bye.